Okay, in chapter 23, we're going to talk about microevolution, or essentially the evolution that occurs in populations, because at the microevolutionary scale, indeed, what evolve are <coughs> populations. And we can specifically define microevolutionary microevolution as a change in allele frequencies from one generation to the next. And so we can see that nicely <coughs> with our Galapagos finches, um, specifically for beak size and shape, there is um, changes uh, through time based on environmental conditions and food supply such that at certain times a larger beak or a smaller beak are favor, favored and a more pointed versus a more uh, robust beak shape are favored. And so as we learned um, with uh, studying Mendel and Darwin that traits that evolve have a genetic basis and so something like beak size clearly has a genetic basis because it does evolve and change through time. However, um, you can have situations where um, a uh, change can does not necessarily result from a genetic change from one generation but due to what we could call oops, phenotypic plasticity, and that is plasticity. These are these uh, caterpillars, and um, they, have, uh, they can have the same genetic makeup, but depending on their environment, they can assume a different form. So, for example, these caterpillars on the left, they are consuming the flower clusters of oak trees and then because of that they get certain chemicals in their diet that um, cause them to the, essentially look like the flower clusters. There's the caterpillar, the flower clusters are down here. And you can have again a, a, an earthworm or a caterpillar of the same genotype but it, when it feeds on leaves it uh, assumes a, a morphology that makes it look like a twig uh, on the branch. And so that's a change. It's not necessarily due to a genetic change, but just a change in, in diet. All right. Now, um, to favor variation, uh, you not only have to have a trait that has a genetic basis, but having variation uh, most definitely helps. And you can find variation across a landscape. Um, these mice were introduced into this island and, and from a single population, but have spread around and become somewhat isolated such that the population on one side of the island is significantly different from the other side of the island. <coughs> and when you have a species that is found across a landscape, you, know, you essentially get the development of what you might call a cline or a transition across that landscape such that here's this particular fish that you find in the Atlantic Ocean and when it lives in warmer waters there's a particular form of a gene, a particular allele that is relatively low frequency but as you get into colder and colder water this allele becomes much more common. So this allele is clearly involved with helping these fish survive in these cold waters and having this form of allele is of no benefit in um, these warmer waters and perhaps could be actually detrimental and so it has a very low frequency. So geography, we see variation in, 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 in genes across the landscape. Now, um, so what can generate this uh, variation, this genetic variation? Well, at its most basic, mutations are, as it's said, the raw create the raw materials for evolution, essentially forming new alleles. We often think of mutations as being uh, deleterious or, or bad for, for an organism, but we should keep in mind that sometimes you can have mutations occurring, forms of alleles arising that are beneficial to that organism and that 
population and species. Uh, previous chapters we talked about uh, chromosomal changes um, that can occur such that, for example, you might get duplication of a particular piece of a chromosome or duplication of particular genes. And um, you should think, for example, with the, the globin genes and how you now have what's called a gene, gene family. And what this does is when you have a single gene that through gene duplication becomes two separate genes, those genes can begin to differentiate or take different, different evolutionary trajectories, <clears throat> giving that organism greater evolutionary potential. Um, also things like uh, transposons or jumping genes can make copies of genes and spread them around and again create opportunities for <clears throat> greater evolutionary potential. Um, re rapid reproduction in particular in organisms like bacteria or protista or even in something say a mouse relative to say an elephant. The mouse has a much shorter generation time than the elephant and so that gives this organism a greater um, evolutionary potential because whenever you have meiosis occurring we know that this is going to through sexual reproduction create new combinations also sometimes mistakes are made during meiosis and so that can generate new forms that may not always be deleterious and so the more rapidly an organism is reproducing um, it can create new um, forms of genes, new combinations. And like I said, sexual reproduction that takes the um, genes in an organism and through the process of meiosis sort of reshuffles them and those reshuffled combinations are then passed on to offspring and so those offspring will have new combinations of genes that can give that organism, that individual, a um, different um, evolutionary perspective, if you will, compared to their parents um, and the ability to take a different evolutionary trajectory. All right, so now Hardy Weinberg. So Hardy Weinberg is this, or what's sometimes known as the Hardy Weinberg principle. This is a essentially a mathematical model of a gene pool. And a gene pool is in a population, it's essentially all the genes or alleles in that population. So think of it this way, we can have, if we look at just a single genetic locus and we only have, we have two alleles, we can of course have these potential genotypes in that population. And depending on how many of each of these you have, you will have a certain frequency of the big A and a certain frequency of the little a. And that can vary between populations, giving those populations gene pool, different allele frequencies, genotype frequencies, etc. And so Hardy-Weinberg is sort of uh, very much uh, concerned with and related to these allele frequencies and genotype frequencies that you see in a population. So when you think of a population, you can think of not only the individuals in the population, but all of the alleles in that population. Um, so if in this example, all of the alleles in that population, if essentially 80% of them are of the red type and 20% of them are the white type, and so that gives us a particular frequency for each of those alleles. Um, and so when as in the population uh, as a whole, when gametes are being made, essentially 80% of the gametes should get a red and 20% should get a white. And the same when you're making sperm cells. And so when you take those frequencies, those, reprodu those frequencies of those different um, alleles in our gametes, you'll come to particular frequencies of genotypes that you would expect in that population based on 
these allele frequencies. And so that's what Hardy-Weinberg is essentially saying. If you know the allele frequencies in a population, you can calculate the genotype frequencies. And it's based here, it is, on this, oops, on this equation right here. P squared plus 2P cubed plus Q squared equals 1. Essentially, P squared represents the homozygous combination of um, one of those alleles. It's typically, say, the dominant form. Q squared represents the homozygous combination of the other allele, typically the recessive. And 2PQ, or PQ, essentially represents the heterozygotes. Now, um, you'll see that we have the 2 in front of our heterozygous combination because, and when you look at our Punnett square here, you see there are two different ways to create that heterozygous individual. There's only one way to create the homozygous dominant and one way to create the homozygous recessive. Again, you get one home, you get the dominant allele from mom and the dominant allele from dad, or the dominant allele from mom, dominant allele from dad. But with heterozygotes, you can happen either way. You can get the dominant from dad, recessive from mom, or the recessive from dad, dominant from mom. So there are two different ways of getting that that combination. Okay. <clears throat> So, again, with Hardy-Weinberg, if you know the allele frequencies, you can calculate genotype frequencies. Now, this will work. That is, the allele frequencies will allow you to accurately calculate the um, genotype frequencies when certain assumptions are met. And that is that there is no mutation occurring in that population. Mating is random. That is, you don't just have reds mating with reds and white mating with whites, for example, but there's an equal probability of mating with any other type of individual. There's no selection, no particular genotypes are favored. You have a relatively large population, and we'll see in the next video why that applies. And you essentially have no gene flow occurring. That is, you do not have individuals coming into that population or leaving that population and taking their alleles with them. Um, so when you look at these, essentially what these all equate to is a population that is not evolving. So Hardy-Weinberg applies to populations that are not evolving. Okay. So you may ask yourself, all right, well, how often does that apply? Is there ever a population that's not evolving? Well, probably not when you look at the complete genome of that organism, but we can find particular genetic loci that really do not evolve or change much from one generation to the next. So Hardy-Weinberg can apply, and often does, to certain genetic loci. But then the others, there can be um, mutations that occur. There can be really strong selection for that genetic locus. Um, we can have populations where there is not random mating, where there is um, preferential mating of certain types. Small populations, they'll tend to go through what's called genetic drift. We'll talk about in the next video. And again, if you've got lots of genes coming into or leaving the population, that's going to cause a change in allele frequencies from one generation to the next. But what Hardy-Weinberg does for us is allows us to, again, look at an a population, look at particular, particular genetic loci, and determine sort of on whole, is that population changing much? Is it evolving much? Um, are there particular genetic loci that are perhaps evolving at a, at a more rapid rate than others? Okay.